Today we're going to take a look at the next topic on our list, topic 7, chemical equilibrium. So most reactions that we've done up to this point uh, in the course are what we call irreversible reactions. So we've studied things that, that go in, in one direction. So we start with reactants, they react, and they form products. And you may not get 100% product, depending on our percent yield, um, but we don't generally think about going backwards. So you know, an example would be combustion. Uh, you start with some type of hydrocarbon, uh, for example, like methane or ethane, um, and you combust it with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. Now, it's not that theoretically we could break carbon dioxide and water apart to its atoms and, 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 and rebuild what we started with, but for example, if we had a, a tree like in the image and then lit a tree on fire, um, it, it'd be pretty hard to rebuild that from uh, carbon dioxide and, and, and water that go into the air. So we call these irreversible reactions. Now, what we also have are reversible reactions. Now, these reactions can go in the normal direction we think of from reactants to products, but they can also go from products to reactants. So we can do the reaction in reverse. Okay, uh, one example of this is the hydration and dehydration of copper sulfate. So copper sulfate, you've seen many times, uh, it's the blue substance that we're familiar with. If you heat up that solid blue copper sulfate, the crystallized form, um, it will turn into a white powder or white solid substance. Okay, and what happens is the water is evaporating off of the compound, so it's breaking off of the copper sulfate, leaving us with the anhydrous form, which is white. But we can reverse this reaction by just adding water back in. So if we take our white anhydrous copper sulfate, add some water, you'll see that it turns back to its blue color. So that is a reversible reaction. Physical state changes are also uh, a, are reversible as well, such as taking water. We can freeze water, and you can let it sit out on the counter and let it melt back into uh, a liquid. So that is a reversible um, process as well. Okay, so this process we're talking about in chemistry, when we can reverse a reaction, when a reaction naturally is reversed, we say that it is in a state of equilibrium. Again, this equilibrium, uh, a lot of reactions throughout history would uh, have been undergoing equilibrium, but it wasn't extensively studied uh, until Fritz Haber, uh, who discovered the Haber process along with uh, Karl Bosch, who was a chemical engineer that worked with him. So these two scientists were the first to really study uh, the processes behind equilibrium and really understand what it means to be in equilibrium um, and what takes place and how do we process reactions that are in equilibrium. So they revolutionized these ideas. Um, Haber actually won the Nobel Prize for the synthesis of ammonia. Uh, for, so that is the Haber process, is by taking nitrogen and hydrogen and producing ammonia from it. Ammonia is hugely important uh, for one particular reason, is for making fertilizers. So by him studying the synthesis and improving and maximizing the yield of the synthesis of ammonia, uh, a, a lot more produce is able to be grown for on farms, uh, so more people can survive uh, uh, on the food that's grown. Okay, so he got the Nobel Prize for that, but it was a quite a controversial Nobel Prize um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, this is the ammonia process here. We have our nitrogen and hydrogen going to NH3, which is ammonia. Um, but the controversy, controversy behind his Nobel Prize comes from the fact that this ammonia synthesis also allowed uh, during the war uh, for nitric acid to be produced, which can be made from ammo uh, ammonia, which can then be used to create explosives. Um, so this was actually used, this process, to then uh, create a lot of explosives uh, during the war, as well as Haber working uh, for Germany during World War I. So I believe this was before he discovered the Haber process, but he uh, was one of the scientists that aided in the weaponizing of chlorine gas uh, that ended up killing thousands and thousands of uh, of people during the war. 
Um, so it was actually debated whether they should give him the Nobel Prize or not because of these things. Um, during World War II, after, after working with Germany, he was actually excommunicated from, uh, from Germany for not being of German descent. So let's get into a bit of equilibrium, though. Enough chemical history for now, even though it's super interesting. So equilibrium reactions uh, occur when the backwards reaction, okay, so when we go from products to reactants, takes place as easily as the forward reaction. So the reactants can go forward, but just as easily the products can go back. Okay, so here's a general reaction. A plus B goes to C plus D. Uh, that symbol you see in the middle this guy, that is our equilibrium arrow. So instead of drawing the yield arrow just going to the right, we draw this, which represents the reaction can go back and forward. Okay, so for example here, A and B react to make C and D, but C and D can also react to form A and B. Okay, we're going to study the four main conditions required uh, for a reaction to maintain an equilibrium. So that means this is all happening simultaneously. The forward reaction is taking place at the same time the reverse reaction is taking place within this, within this beaker or whatever container we're looking at. Okay, so the first, uh, uh, the first statement is that the forward and reverse reactions occur at the same rate. So at equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Okay, the reaction is also dynamic. So what that means is it never stops. It doesn't hit a certain concentration and then the reaction stops. It keeps going forever, reacting in both directions simultaneously. At equilibrium, there'll be a mixture of reactants and products present. So let's take a look at our graph we have. Um, so the y-axis is our rate of reaction and the x-axis is our time. So what's happening here is the forward reaction. So that's our reaction of reactants going to products. Okay, that's starting. We're starting uh, with a very high rate. Whoops. Okay, we're starting with quite a high rate because we're starting, we're assuming, with all reactants. So the rate of reactants going to products is quite high. Now the rate of products going to reactants, so the opposite, is starting at zero because we don't have any products at the beginning. So what happens is the rate of reactants. As products are produced, we get less and less reactants, so the rate starts to drop. Okay, and the opposite is true. As products are being formed, the rate of the reverse reaction will start to increase because as the products are more and more products are being formed, there's more of a chance they're going to react with each other as the concentration increases, so the rate goes up. And there becomes a point when both of these, the forward reaction reacts to the point where its rate becomes equal to that of the reverse reaction. So you're, you're forming products at the same rate as you're forming the reactants, and this is the state we call equilibrium. So again, when that product reaction and that reverse reaction, or sorry, yeah, the, product, uh, the forward and reverse reaction rates are equal. The next thing is that the concentration of reactants and products are equal, or sorry, at equilibrium are constant. Okay, this does not mean that they are equal. So the concentrations will stay the same, but they don't have to be the same as each other. And an equilibrium, so an important fact here, is that equilibrium can be reached from either direction. So we can start with all products, or we can start with all reactants, or a mixture of the two. So we'll take a look at this reaction. N2O4 is uh, equilibrium with 2NO2. Okay, so in this case, take a look, concentration is now on our y-axis, so we're not looking at a rate graph anymore, we're looking at concentration versus time. We're starting our high concentration of all NO2, and we start with zero N2O4. Now over time, the concentration of NO2, uh, which is actually our products, starts to decrease. Okay, and as it decreases, you can see its rate is starting to slow off, so it's getting slower and slower until it flattens out and remains constant. During this time, as it's reacting, it's producing N2O4. As we produce more and more N2O4, the rate starts to go up, but it too will then taper off at a certain point and get to a constant. At this point, when both lines are flat, 
Okay, this is where it has now hit equilibrium. This is where the rate of the two of them are constant. Um, but again, the rate's constant, but the concentrations do not have to be constant. Okay, and we'll look at those calculations in the next lesson. Um, we can start in a, a, a with a different amount of, of products. So we can start with all reactant in this case and all N0 products. So 0 NO2 and all N2O4. Same thing happens. As the N2O4 reacts, its uh, concentration decreases until the rate is, is constant. And the NO2, its concentration increases until again, the rate is constant. Okay. Or we could start with perhaps a mixture of uh, both reactants. Okay, now in this case, the we'll see this when we calculate the equilibrium constant, and then you'll see why there, these things are certain distances apart. Um, in this case, we're starting with a mixture of a bit of both. So the product, or sorry, the reactants are actually increasing a little bit, and the products are decreasing in concentration until they become constant and hit their equilibrium. Um, whether Which one is going to increase and which one is going to decrease if you start with a mixture, this depends on something called the equilibrium constant, which we'll take a look at in the next lesson. So the third factor for equilibrium is that equilibrium requires a closed system. So if you remember, a closed system is one where the reactants or products cannot escape from the reaction vessel. Okay, Energy can be transferred back and forth, but matter cannot. In an open system, matter can get out. So for equilibrium, we have to be in a closed system because if we're losing matter, that, that disrupts the balance of, of our equilibrium. And the final one is that there's no change in macroscopic properties at, this, uh, at equilibrium. What a macroscopic property is, is something like color or pressure or pH concentration. So I like to think of color, something you can see on a grand scale. Um, so again, at equilibrium, you won't get a change in color. So for example, here in this reaction to the right, this is our one we just looked at a minute ago, our NO2 and our N2O4 reaction. Um, if we're at uh, certain temperatures, okay, we can change the equilibrium to one side or the other. So here is what it looks like when you have all N2O4 present in this first flask. Okay, we see that it is clear see-through. When you have a lot of NO, NO2 present, it's going to be very, very brown. Okay, the more NO2 pres uh, that's present, the more brown it's going to be. Now, when you have a mixture, it's going to be somewhere in between, so this kind of yellowish color. When this reaction happens, it doesn't jump back and forth from one color to another. It doesn't suddenly start as white and then jump to brown and then back to white and then back to brown. No, it'll look like just this middle one. Okay, and it'll stay constant as this color. You won't be able to actually see a difference. If you tested the pH, the pH would be constant. Um, the pressure would remain constant. So none of these things would actually change with uh, an equilibrium. Okay, so those are our four properties. Uh, physical equilibrium also exists. So physical changes can reach an equilibrium. Um, in this flask on the right here, on the left we have our water that is all in a liquid in a flask. So there would have been a vacuum created above, for instance. Um, and if you leave it in that flask, what will happen is the water particles will start to evaporate into a gas. Okay, once it's established in this form, um, the water will, every time a water molecule evaporates off, a gas molecule condenses back into the water. So it maintains this equilibrium, which means you'll see the volume of the water stay constant, for example. Um, this is the same for if you have a solid liquid equilibrium, if you have ice in water and leave it at zero degrees, okay, the ice and water will constantly, uh, on the surface of the ice, will constantly be freezing and melting. Um, but the same principles apply, so the equilibrium must be dynamic. Okay, uh, The forward rate has to be equal to the verse, reverse rate. The volume of liquid remains constant, so that's like before we said the concentrations remain constant in a physical, the... Uh, volume will remain constant. It can be achieved only in a closed system, and there's no macroscopic changes.